Good morning, all. Ah, uh, na good morning. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, Sino, sir. Mohan, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Sandar ki. Good morning. Rani, madam. Varlakshmi, madam. All. Good morning. Yeah, Rajesh, ready? Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Good morning, Rajesh, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Let me know when to start and then I'll get it started. <coughs> yeah, time is... Uh, yeah, please, sir, please start. You can start. Okay, good morning all. It's uh, Dr. Rajesh Shetty. I'm a clinical lead and chief of clinical services of Manipal Hospital Whitefield. Uh, there is a slight change uh, in the program. I think uh, by mistake you had sent the topic of uh, hypoxia in VV ECMO. That will happen uh, you know, later in this week. Uh, today's uh, topic was supposed to be uh, ECMO in COVID. Um, the reason we, uh, you know, we are still uh, doing this talk, even though we are coming out of COVID pandemic, is that we are still seeing patients with COVID. Majority of them are just an incidental finding and their primary disease is something else. But having said that, still, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, the Delta virus, uh, uh, less of Omicron virus, where you will get a severe ambience. And the many of them end on uh, ECMO as well. So it is still relevant. And I'll be talking about uh, some other related topics like awake ECMO, which is becoming very popular nowadays, and uh, the lung transplant, which is one of the options uh, which has been tried in COVID patients who have not uh, recovered from their respiratory failure at all. So that's the, you know, the logic behind having this talk uh, in this presentation. Are you able to see my uh, this thing? Uh, are yes, you, sir. Yes, sir. Now, the, what is the indications for uh, ECMO in COVID patients? It's the same as in non-COVID patients. You know, um, uh, exactly the same ARDS patients you will consider in COVID patients as well. And uh, as in other cases, it is a last resort. You, know, you will do this only when you are all other uh, treatment for uh, standard ARDS treatment you have tried, including prone ventilation, and it has failed. Basically, there are two types of ECMOs. One is called VV ECMO. I'm sure Dr. Jumana would have uh, gone through that on Monday. And another one is uh, VA ECMO. VV ECMO is usually done for respiratory failure, either hypoxemic respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure. You know, hypoxemic respiratory failure for the purpose of ECMO, you would think as per the ELSO guidelines, PF ratio less than 150 on FIO2 of more than 90% with the optimized P. And a hypercapnic respiratory failure, you would say when pH is less than 7.25. This is a sort of a new indication uh, which has come in, uh, you know, mainly with the purpose that if patient's CO2 is so low that it is affecting uh, this pH, uh, then any increase in ventilator, uh, ventilator setting is only going to cause more harm to the lung. And by uh, initiating ECMO, uh, you are providing ultra low protective ventilation so that there is a chance that patient might recover. And uh, you know, as we said before, this is only done when uh, the conventional ventilator management has failed, including prone ventilation. Some of these patients might need a VA ECMO as well. That is usually when they, they are accompanied by severe heart failure. You know, uh, especially cold patients are known to have cardiac involvement, including RV dysfunction, excessive shunting through the lungs, arrhythmias, acute myocardial infarction, acute myocarditis. All of these might uh, lead to uh, heart failure as well, along with uh, ventilator, uh, respiratory failure. And these patients, you would uh, you know, uh, opt for a V ECMO as well. Now, what is uh, uh, VV ECMO? VV ECMO. I think I'm sure Dr. Jumana have, would have covered this already. But just briefly, uh, you know, VV ECMO is uh, you do when uh, the blood is removed from the venous system, passed through an artificial uh, you know uh, oxygenator, the machine, then returned back to the venous system itself. And uh, this is done uh, 
uh, only for uh, respiratory failure. It only provides oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. Whereas VA ECMO, here you remove the blood from the venous system, uh, pass it through the artificial heart and lung, and then return it to the arterial system. Uh, here, you provide both pulmonary support and the cardiac support. I'll just lower this one so that I can see the full slide. Now, what are the contact indications? You know, indications we have talked about. Contact indication, I have to say, there are very few contact indications. Uh, you know, uh, ECMO is usually offered to those patients where everything else has, uh, uh, you know, failed, and uh, this is the last resort. And if you don't offer this, the patient is going to die. And so, you know, nothing can be worse than uh, the dying patient. So, if there is an option of this, you should consider in all the patients. Having said that. There are some conditions where you know uh, the overall outcome is not going to change. The patient has got a poor, very poor outcome, either because the primary disease has reached a, such a stage that uh, the multi-organ failure uh, is very severe, and uh, uh, putting them on ECMO is not going to change that outcome, or because they have some other uh, background health condition which makes them unsuitable for any uh, invasive treatment, uh, you know, including ECMO, like advanced malignancy, uh, severe neurological injury, where they had a cardiac arrest uh, with a prolonged CPR and hypoxic brain injury, or if they have had a uh, central venous system hemorrhage uh, recently, or there is already one and it is expanding, these are probably you would say as a contraindication. Uh, now, how do you initiate ECMO? Initiating ECMO is going to be very similar to uh, non-COVID patients. I'm sure this would have been covered as well, but uh, there are some things which are slightly different compared to normal uh, patients, mainly because of the need for isolation and a separate place where it is given and reduce the risk of exposure to other patient, other staff, other clinical areas. So, you know, in some centers, the cannulation is done in either cath lab or, or in OT. But uh, for COVID patients, probably you would uh, do it in bedside itself you know, because you don't want to move the patients anywhere. And usually, you know, the uh, are relaxing now, but usually, I think there is some disturbance. Uh, usually, you know, uh, you will use a full uh, PPE. And full PPE itself has got its own, uh, you know, disadvantages, with, uh, including ease of uh, working around uh, and you know, communication and things like that. Usually, uh, especially for COVID patients, you will have two teams. One team which will be uh, dealing with the initiation of ECMO itself, including cannulation and all that. And another one which will be looking at the clinical management of the patient who often are very ill with you know, severe hypoxemia and maybe hemodynamic instability as well. Now, what are the types of cannulation? Again, it will be the same compared to others. Uh, you know, you have femoral and internal jugular, which is the usual access where, uh, you know, blood will be taken from the femoral uh, cannula and it will, it will be put back into the internal jugular venous cannula. <laughs> there are new, there are new uh, uh, catheters are coming, which are called, uh, you know, bi cable dual lumen single catheter. Uh, it is being common, more and more being used. Having said that, in COVID patients, probably you wouldn't uh, prefer this because uh, this needs the patient to be shifted to... Who is Shetty uh, or Rajesh Shetty? So, this is Rajesh Shetty. Who is this? Sorry. And sorry, Dr. Mohan. Everyone, sorry. everyone, uh, hi, Dr. everyone Mohan. just uh, be in mute, no? Please, other than Dr. Rajesh Shetty. Please. Thank you. Thank you. So, is it... Uh, shall I continue? Hello? Yes, I continue. Yes, 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 yes please. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you know, usually bi cable uh, dual uh, lumen single catheter you will not use in COVID patients because it involves moving the patient to a cath lab using TE. So, more people are required, more places are required. So, you would stick to your standard femoral and IJV cannula access itself. And blood flow, like in any other uh, ECMO patients, what you want is 60 to 70 percent of uh, cardiac output. Now, the management of ECMO, again, uh, it's not very different to you know, non-COVID patients. Uh, you, uh, Depending on whether it's a VV ECMO or a VA ECMO, you would have your goals uh, for goals of oxygenation, goals for your ventilation, which is usually an ultra uh, no, uh, protective uh, lung ventilation, and uh, your hemodynamic uh, goals. And you will titrate your flows uh, to achieve that. And once uh, the patient's uh, lung starts improving, you will start uh, you know, reducing the support. Um, usually in COVID patients, what we have seen is that uh, their sedation requirement is higher. 
uh, it may be because uh, they are more younger patients, more anxious patients, or it may be uh, related to the COVID uh, you know, affection of the CNS system itself. But usually you will see that they need a higher sedation compared to others. And uh, this is where the AVIC, uh, you know, ECMO uh, comes into play, which I will talk later. Um, now, what happens if the oxygenation is not maintained even after ECMO? Uh, you know, usually there are lots of things you can do to you know, resolve the situation. You, one of the commonest cause is a recirculation. You know, usually the, uh, the access and return cannula, if they are very close together, uh, the blood instead of going to the patient's body will co come from ECMO and go back to ECMO itself and uh, the oxygenation will not improve. So for this, you will do a chest x-ray. You see what is the distance between the two cannula. It should be at least eight centimeter to prevent uh, re recirculation. And sometime you may have to adjust the mechanical ventilatory parameters as well. I would advise not to do this because the whole purpose of uh, doing ECMO is you want to protect the lungs. Any changes in ventilation you do to improve the oxygenation or gas exchange, uh, you are losing that purpose. And if uh, ECMO is working well, uh, you know, even if the uh, lung is not working at all, you should be able to maintain ad adequate gas exchange. So I would say, you know, uh, in my practice, I have never been uh, you know, required to change the mechanical ventilatory parameters. We are with the adjustment of ECMO circuit and other things itself, you, you know, we have been able to manage. Prone vent positioning has been tried in ECMO patients. You know, as I said, I feel that it is not required because if the ECMO is working well, you should be able to maintain oxygenation and uh, CO2 removal. So there is no need for lungs at all. Uh, having said that, you know, there is lots of uh, case reports of prone positioning during ECMO. Uh, so it is feasible. And in one of the studies, uh, you know, I saw that uh, uh, 61 and 81 percent of uh, COVID patients in one study were placed. In, so nearly 81 percent of patients in there, they had a total of 61. They had put on prone ventilation. I think their management is probably very different to ours. I think I, I don't uh, find a reason why you know so many patients had to be prone ventilated. But having said that, you know, it is possible to prone patients on ECMO itself. Okay, and uh, we mobilize the patients on ECMO all the time. I will uh, show you the videos, uh, you know, later. So I'm sure, you know, if you have expertise and if you have experience, you have enough staff, it should be possible to do the prone uh, uh, ventilation as well on ECMO patients. And usually it is better to have an early extubation strategy and uh, consider awake ECMO because of, uh, you know, all the complications patients and uh, uh, other problems uh, related with uh, COVID patients, especially if they are an ECMO, and uh, we will talk about that a little later. Now, uh, like uh, any ECMOs, uh, you need to maintain anticoagulation. Having said that, COVID is a special group of patients, as you know, uh, they have a hypercoagulable uh, state. Uh, so uh, there are, you know, if that happens, the circuit can might get clotted, pulmonary embolism may happen, and there is evidence, which I will talk later, which shows that uh, COVID ECMO patients are more prone for these complications compared to others. And, uh, you know, there are complications of anticoagulation itself, including bleeding, thrombosis, and, uh, you know, balancing uh, the clotting risk versus uh, bleeding risk. It's a very fine balancing act. Usually, uh, you know, we follow APTT ratio and uh, most of the centers have started uh, following APTT ratio compared to ACT ratio. And uh, you'd uh, like to keep it around 1.5 times uh, the normal value. And you need to keep checking for thrombi in the oxygenator circuit because, uh, you know, if it increases, you may have to change the circuit itself. Another common uh, problems uh, we have seen in COVID patients is uh, hypertension. Uh, you know, uh, these patients seem to be very prone for hypertension and uh, you need to control this aggressively because uh, um, the other, other complication related to hypertension is intracranial hemorrhage, uh, especially because these patients are on anticoagulation. And we have had a patient who had an intracranial hemorrhage because of hypertension. And these patients are usually younger patients uh, and maybe because of anxiety or other factors, they seem to be particularly prone for uh, hypertension. And this needs to be you know, monitored closely and uh, treated aggressively. Now, how do you wean from ECMO? Uh, basically, you wait for uh, the lungs to improve. Then your uh, oxygen uh, saturation will improve. Your uh, lung compliance will improve. And then uh, you'll uh, think of weaning them uh, from ECMO. Having said that, in COVID patients, 
we what we have seen is that they usually require ECMO for a very long period of time. And you know, according to studies, the one of the studies mentioned here, I'll mention other studies later, the median duration was 29 days. And uh, sometimes it may be as long as the three to six weeks or even longer, you know, as I will uh, present uh, uh, later. This is uh, data from some other uh, observational studies where uh, median was 13.9 days, median was 20 days and uh, mean was 18 days. Uh, and uh, another thing what we have seen is that, uh, you know, usually um, after four weeks, for example, if the lung has not recovered and patient is on uh, uh, ECMO, you would think of a lung transplant. But uh, COVID patients seems to be a special group where even after a prolonged illness, the complete recovery of the lung is possible. Uh, so maybe, you know, even if it is more than 28 days, you should wait on ECMO rather than considering a lung transplant because especially in India, the outcomes uh, with the lung transplants are not very good. So I think uh, especially in COVID uh, patients, it may be uh, better to wait for the lung recovery before considering a lung transplant. And obviously, um, you know, these patients will have a very prolonged hospitalization. But uh, surprisingly, the long hospitalization doesn't lead into a higher mortality rate. I will, uh, you know, I will come to that uh, a little later. Uh, you know, this is one of the data. Before May 2020, the mortality was 36.9, which is similar to, you know, non-COVID patients. For the remainder of the 2020, uh, this is as per the ELSO data, the mortality increased to 58.9%. Uh, people think it's probably related to you know, the load of patients we had, the sickness of the patients we had, and the indications which kept on changing uh, during that time. Overall, it can be said that as per the ELSA registry, if you include all the patients, 90-day mortality is 40%, which is similar to you know in, in your non-COVID uh, uh, patients itself. This is one of the French studies. Uh, you know, initial uh, Chinese studies showed that uh, mortality was very high in COVID patients who were put on ECMO. So initially, there was less enthusiasm to put patients on uh, ECMO. Then this uh, French uh, study came, uh, which showed uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, on flow chart, out of 83 patients, only 30 patients died. And the uh, no, rest of the patients uh, survived. Estimated mortality was around 31%. Uh, this gives some confidence to people uh, that actually uh, it may not be a bad thing to offer ECMO to COVID patients. And uh, here, the other point I want to highlight, this is day 28, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. And if you look at the mortality, 18%, 23%, 27%, 31%. After day 70, it doesn't increase much. From day 70 to day 90, it has increased, mortality has increased only from 31% to 36%. So as I said before, even though they need a longer period on ECMO and longer hospitalization, the most of the mortality happens in the first 30 to 50 days itself. If the patient survives the first 50 days, after that, the mortality is not as high as you know we usually worry. As discussed before, you know this is one of the studies which showed that COVID patients have a higher rate of PE uh, and uh, they seem to have a higher risk of uh, ventilated associated uh, pneumonia as well. Uh, this is uh, from the ELSO registry. This includes all the patients who have been put on ECMO all over the world who are registered uh, with uh, ELSO and uh, they considered only patients uh, more than 16 years or older. And uh, they had 395 centers. Our center is one of them. We are registered with the ELSO and we submit all of our data from 48 countries and uh, the primary outcome they were looking at is in hospital death at 90 days and secondary outcome was a discharge allocation and if you see here majority of the patients were discharged either they were discharged home or to a long care facility and uh, overall death was only 37 percent which is very similar to non-covid patients this was one of the reasons why people started getting confidence and uh, second uh, wave onwards more and more patients were put on uh, ECMO. I, I would uh, say that uh, whatever popularity we have for ECMO probably uh, has come after the COVID pandemic. Now, even uh, common people uh, realize that uh, there is a treatment option called ECMO and that can be successful as well. And, uh, you know, in our experience, we see routinely patients themselves and coming and asking us whether we can consider ECMO uh, in, the, in their patient. And this is all I would uh, say thanks to COVID itself. This is to highlight uh, the, uh, the mortality itself. As you can see from day 40 onwards, the cumulative mortality, there is hardly any increase. So even though these COVID patients need a long hospital stay, uh, please don't uh, lose hope. Uh, these patients uh, you know, will do well. All you have to do is wait until uh, their lung uh, gets better. These are the some of the bad prognostic factors, higher age, 
immunocompromised state, chronic respiratory disease, if they had a cardiac arrest before starting ECMO itself, and if the initial mode was not VV, like either VA or VA, VVA, they have a higher risk of mortality compared to other patients. And this is the discharge location at day 19, only this many patients were died. And these patients were still alive. Either they were discharged or they were in the hospital or they were in the long care facility. So the mortality is not uh, you know, very bad in ECMO patients uh, you know, after uh, COVID. Now, what about uh, the other outcomes? This study looked into uh, the co-infection. You know, this is in COVID groups and this is in influenza groups. As you can see, in COVID uh, group, 43 patients had we have similar number of patients, 58 patients here and 60 patients here. Out of that, 43 pa uh, patients had VAP and four died. Compared to influenza, the historical controls, 28 patients had VAP and no one died. So COVID patients seem to have a higher risk of uh, infection. And what type of, how many infections they have? You know, it can be either one or more than one and it is significantly more compared to influenza patients and uh, the pathogen seems to be the same usual you know, gram negative bacteria and uh, uh, you know the recurrence of uh, vap also seems to be higher in covid patients compared to non covid patients now what is the reason for a higher infection risk in covid patients it may be because these patients are on mechanical ventilation for a longer period of time uh, they have, you know, we do give them immunosuppressive agent and the, the pathology itself is a, you know, immune, uh, immune uh, dysregulation and this dysregulated lung inflammation itself may cause diffuse alveolar damage and that may make it uh, more prone for a lung infection and uh, you know, pulmonary vasculopathy with endothelial dysfunction and endotheliolitis might be, you know, causing a higher risk of infection as well and uh, maybe because of all these uh, problems, the antibiotic availability in the lung parenchyma might be limited. And that may be another reason why these patients seem to be getting more infection and reinfection as well. Now, uh, where in the peak of the pandemic, uh, there was a question whether ECMO is justified during the pandemic itself. Uh, and uh, and uh, the ELSO and other experts, what they believe is that because there is a, such a good uh, mortality benefit, you should de definitely be considered. But before that, make sure that your conventional treatment, the best possible treatment you have provided, uh, you have to have an intelligent uh, patient selection. And when you have more patients, maybe it is better to cohort them so that less number of staff will be able to see more patients. Uh, you know, even though during pandemic you are stretched, it doesn't mean that it will uh, stretch your staffing as well. If you intelligently manage, it may be you know easier to manage them and you may be able to save more patients. You never know, you know, in future again, we might get a pandemic. And if that happens, maybe these strategies might help. The other thing they suggest that, you know, whenever you are part of uh, ECMO program, be part of a uh, research as well. You know, this is one of them called ECMO. Card. It's an international uh, study on uh, ECMO patients. Uh, it was started during COVID pandemic. Probably they will continue this. Uh, we are one of the you know, uh, participants of this study. Uh, we have submitted about uh, you know, 600 COVID patients and all our uh, uh, you know, ECMO patients as well. And uh, we have received a funding of 3 lakh rupees for being part of uh, you know, this study. And uh, they suggest that if you're running an ECMO program, probably you should be part of some study that so that you can contribute to the no uh, knowledge development uh, in this particular area. Now, ECMO guidelines have been, uh, ELSO guidelines have been uh, you know, uh, uh, re-updated after the COVID. And their advice is that if a patient is in respiratory failure, fails conventional treatment, ECMO should be con considered because the outcomes are good. Now, what is awake ECMO? This is one of the new things which is coming uh, in uh, you know, ECMO. Basically, ECMO without mechanical ventilation in a spontaneously breathing patient is what is awake ECMO. There are different uh, definitions for awake ECMO, but basically patients should be awake and should be breathing uh, spontaneously. Uh, now, what are the advantages of awake ECMO? First of all, it reduces uh, the ventilation perfusion mismatch. It helps in improving the tone of respiratory muscles and diaphragm because the patient is breathing spontaneously. It maintains the FRC and uh, the negative pressure which is created during inspiratory phase helps in venous return and cardiac filling and uh, favors the lymphatic drainage. So usually awake ECMO is you know, usually thought to be better for these ECMO patients. And if nothing else, emotionally, they will be much better. Family will be more confident. They are more likely to you know, 
continue with you, especially because uh, COVID patients require a long time on ECMO. So being awake definitely is a plus point. Um, now, how do you decide which patients can go on awake ECMO? You need to assess whether they are ready for extubation first. For that, uh, you know, they should be on minimal ventilator setting and the gas exchange should be adequate, which means that your ECMO is able to take care of the, uh, the, uh, the gas exchange requirement. They should be awake and cooperative and uh, they shouldn't have a multi-organ failure or a severe shock. Mild shock probably is okay. Usually we'll do it uh, not on the first day, usually on the second day. Once uh, the ECMO goals are met, now you will usually leave them on some uh, analgesic, usually fentanyl or nowadays, uh, you know, probably dexamethasone is another infusion for a conscious uh, sedation. Uh, you need to make sure that a patient is oriented to time, place, uh, once they are awake. And uh, the interventions must be explained to the patient and uh, the patient relatives so that, uh, you know, they, they can completely cooperate with the other thing. If it is not possible, it is better to do a tracheostomy and then wean them off the ventilator through the tracheostomy itself. Ideally, in our center, on the second day or third day, we will consider extubation. And if it is not possible, on the same day, we will uh, do the tracheostomy so that uh, the number of days on the ventilator, we can uh, come down. Now, which patients would you consider lung transplant? And, uh, many of these patients with lung failure after COVID uh, don't recover lung function at all. Uh, so, you know, after waiting on the ECMO for a very long long time you may have to consider lung transplant and usually you know you would uh, do that on younger patients who are less than 65 years old who have a single organ dysfunction and uh, you have given sufficient time to make sure that uh, the lung recovery is not possible and should, should, shouldn't be definitely considered before six weeks because uh, lung recovery is possible during that time and if you have to confirm uh, that uh, either radiologically or other way the lung disease is irreversible. It is not going to reverse and there is an established uh, fibrosis and uh, the patient should be able to participate in physical rehabilitation uh, while being on the transplant waiting list because the success of uh, post-transplant uh, you know, surgery will depend on what is their physical condition before transplant. So if they are able to do all of this, probably they will have a better outcome and they should be considered for lung transplant. Now, what is the experience with lung transplant uh, you know, in other patients and COVID patients? This is a USA data between uh, August 2020 to September 2021. So one year, they had done 240, uh, no, 3,039 lung transplant during that period. Even during COVID time pandemic, they did so many uh, lung transplants. Out of that, 7% were for uh, COVID-related respiratory failure. Out of that, you know, out of 7%, 4.6% was for acute respiratory distress syndrome, which didn't get better at all. And 2.4% was for pulmonary fibrosis. Now, what is the survival of these patients who had COVID, who were on ECMO, who required a lung transplant? How did they do it? You know, did they survive? This is a data. This inside uh, graph is basically a you know, magnification of the outside graph itself. As you can see, you know, at three months, the survival was more than 95%. So these uh, patients with lung transplant survived, uh, you know, uh, more than three months, more than 95% of the patients. I have to say the outcome in India is not uh, this good, but hopefully, you know, in future as the lung transplant program improves in India, we might be able to get better outcome than what uh, we have. This is the first case which was uh, done, you know, in your uh, state. Uh, in Hyderabad, which was the first in the country. It was done, uh, it, this was published on 24th of August, 2020. In the first uh, wave itself, the first lung transplant was done. And uh, this is, uh, you know, um, so, sort of summary of what is happening with lung transplant uh, in India. Uh, from my understanding, about uh, 70 lung transplants have been done in India uh, during the COVID pan pandemic for COVID-related issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, the outcomes, it is not uh, still very clear. But there are survivors and, uh, you know, it is not as good as overseas, but uh, on the whole, lung transplant outcomes are not as good as overseas, even for non-COVID patients. But, uh, you know, it, this is one of the viable options. Uh, what I would uh, say is that I will explain to you with my patients uh, later. Many of the COVID patients will completely recover. They may not need a lung transplant at all. I would say, you know, even the recommended time is six weeks. I would wait uh, even longer because many of them will may not require a lung transplant at all. Now, just quickly, um, uh, we have uh, done quite a few of, uh, you know, uh, ECMOs during the COVID pandemic, and our outcomes have been uh, more than 50%, uh, you know, survival, which is quite good compared to the international uh, standards and uh, good compared to other Indian, uh, you know, centers as well. Um, and this is one of the patients who was a 59-year-old man 
who had a past history of hypertension he was in ecmo for 56 days and he was in icu for 66 days and he was in hospital for 108 days he was eventually discharged with the home oxygen and uh, he was one of the patients where we tried awake ecmo which uh, you know made a big big difference and he, at that time when he was in the hospital he was the longest ecmo covid survivor in the world and uh, you know we have been able to get the publication done as well because of that you now because he was in the hospital for such a long time uh, we celebrated his birthday there and uh, you know after he got discharged he was able to attend his daughter's wedding and uh, son's wedding as well and now he's off oxygen and he's able to drive he's able to do everything and uh, this is the second patient who was uh, uh, you know ayurvedic doctor 29 year old with no past medical history she was on ecmo for 43 days and uh, she was the one who had intracranial hemorrhage on day 3 itself Uh, so she was having seizures her gcs had uh, dropped uh, fortunately uh, you know uh, she didn't require surgery but we couldn't use anticoagulation for some time and we used this opportunity to do the trachea on the day 3 itself uh, eventually she stayed in icu for 47 days and on 50 55 days she was discharged home on uh, home oxygen and uh, this is one of the videos to show that it is possible to uh, mobilize patients on ecmo and uh, now we have a extensive experience of this and we routinely you know right. mobilize patients on ecmo and uh, you know it right. makes a big difference in the patient's uh, recovery it makes a big difference in patient's emotions and the family's uh, confidence as well uh, and uh, you know we do this regularly this is another video uh, if you look at the ecmo flows even the patient is walking you know bending sitting and all that uh, there is no a uh, change in the flow obviously you have to closely monitor you need a lot of that is showing the flows which are maintained you know as the patient was on the bed yeah. uh, you need a lot of people but it is possible to you know mobilize these patients and in you know, awake ecmo and uh, mobilizing patients it is going to be a, a really good thing to mobilize uh, these patients and uh, this was the day when she was discharged you know it was nice to see so many people were involved in her care Uh, and uh, this is how she is at home uh, tracheostomy has been removed tracheostomy you know stoma has completely closed she is off oxygen and uh, she is able to you know do almost all the activities and uh, she is getting back to her work as well including you know climbing the stairs and climbing down the stairs stairs she is able to do i you know everything she has almost become uh, normal now now in summary and you know, also recommends that uh, centers experienced in ecmo should consider use in a refractory covid related uh, respiratory failure um, it is better to organize ecmo centers as per the geographic region rather than everyone doing it maybe one uh, hospital or two hospital to should take the leadership and most of the ecmo should happen there this will help in uh, you know maximizing uh, the use of your resources and also improving the outcome ecmo retrieval is feasible we saw that during the covid pandemic and from you know we had patients coming from north india uh, to bangalore so it is possible and it can be done and uh, covid really helped uh, us in understanding that you know ecmo retrieval is like any other retrieval and it can be done and awake ecmo has many practical benefits and uh, this should be considered whenever feasible and ecmo as a bridge to lung transplantation is an acceptable treatment option for selected patients with irreversible respiratory failure due to covid-19 having said that my advice is as you saw those two patients it is better to persist with uh, ecmo for a longer period of time until it is completely clear that uh, you know uh, the lung is not going to recover and uh, only then consider lung transplant and uh, you know the fibrosis of covid Uh, what we have seen i'm sure you would have uh, you know uh, uh, noticed it as well is even though it's a fibrosis it is completely uh, reversible uh, those two patients had a completely white out lung even at the time of uh, discharge you know uh, there was so much fibrosis now you, you see their uh, ct scan it looks completely normal so all that fibrosis has resolved so probably it is better to wait for lung transplant uh, before uh, going for it the recommendation is 6 weeks probably i would wait even longer i would uh, say at least Uh, you know 3 to 4 months you would wait before considering a lung transplant so that is the end of my talk thank you thank you thank you rajesh i i joined late sorry and i missed it i thought that's the reason i thought it's a... thank you thank you very much no problem no problem thank you any questions thank you sir uh, very nice presentation thank you sir you mentioned uh, the outcome of uh, Uh, patients on ECMO, 
non covid and covid scenario yes is it you said it is same is it same or uh, i Absolutely. i heard that uh, uh, covid mm-hmm. patients have more mortality than no, uh, that's why i showed so many you know evidence including the elso registry data which includes uh, most of the centers uh, all over the world whoever is member we are a member of elso and we submit all our data so whoever is member and whoever has submitted data uh, the evidence is that uh, there is no difference in mortality between uh, covid patients and non covid patients i think uh, if some people have had a worse outcome it may be related to other factors you know uh, and uh, i think initially everyone seems to have a poor outcome but as the experience in- improves uh, the outcomes improve as well yeah hi rajesh hi hi shinwar uh, hi so okay. this uh, one interesting case you mentioned that uh, a patient who had a third day intracerebral hemorrhage yes and you managed so yeah. in this patient how did you dose the heparin one yeah. and uh, how did you monitor neurologically daily yes uh, what are the so indications we... where you wind up this ecmo in this patient yeah so basically you know um, what uh, uh, the trend now is to use as less anticoagulation as possible because the new uh, ecmo circuits uh, are very good circuits with a very less friction and uh, the risk of uh, clotting is much lower compared to other patients so you know uh, it is possibly you without uh, anticoagulation you can run a patient even up to a week you know and uh, what we have done is usually we aim for a lower uh, Uh, anticoagulation level if we are uh, doing act initially for the 20, 24 to 48 hours we'll use act and uh, we will uh, you know before we used to do 220 to 240 uh, you know seconds now we do 160 to 170 and that seems to be enough and when uh, when we aim for a aptt just above normal 1 1.1 to 1.5 is the anticoagulation level aptt ratio we look for with that uh, you will be able to reduce uh, the risk of bleeding and uh, in this particular patient you know i think it was uh, not because of anticoagulation it was the hy- hypertension which caused bleeding and uh, you know uh, and uh, aggressive treatment of hypertension is important and we basically stopped anticoagulation for 3 days because the bleeding was quite significant so, fortunately so you are mentioning that uh, heparin free circuits are available which you can run up to one week yeah the uh, one you get they are already hyperin coated yes. uh, i think uh, uh, yes. sir this one um, uh, i think this we have started a patient on uh, dengue severe okay. rds mm. uh, but uh, landed out to be after four days or five days uh, had a hypernatremia mm. and uh, gcs is dropped found to be di mm. so i think this patient which we have initiated on heparin coated you know with yes. respect to free go which machine you have which uh, i machine machine okay i would uh, think you would use a rotaflow yeah yeah usually uh, the circuit which is used is called pls that is a very good circuit actually that is that comes with uh, anti uh, heparin coated uh, this thing um, okay. and uh, they have uh, this roller pump uh, you know no, not roller pump centrifugal pump compared to roller pump before the risk of friction and uh, uh, you know rbc damage and clotting is much less as well maybe you know uh, see next time whether you'll be able to manage with less anticoagulation i know uh, you jumana would have spoken to you on monday uh, she is almost uh, running many of her patients without any anticoagulation at all because of this risk of bleeding and all that sure. and uh, so the more... coated uh, circuit it doesn't require uh, anticoagulation rajesh uh, for vv ecmo you i would then say no requirement for anticoagulation but uh, uh, you know lesser anticoagulation is okay just above normal range is okay you don't don't need to you know heavily anticoagulate these patients uh, for vv ecmo va ecmo is a little dif- uh, different because you know they can analyze in the artery and any clot we can cause uh, you know uh, get embolization and uh, cause complication so probably you will have a higher anticoagulation for va ecmo but for vv ecmo you can take a risk and uh, you know you can run on a very low anticoagulation level Yeah, I guess this uh, we see see to discuss it is very easy, but yes. uh, maintaining on an ECMO uh, for an oxygenation. See, we are on a full flow of uh, oxygenator with hundred percent oxygen, mm. and uh, we are uh, the we see the cannula positions are okay, the blood pressure is okay. Why still we need to put these patients on a prone ventilation or? Uh, 
why we struggle yeah. for uh, a little fio2 towards a ventilator for oxygenation yeah uh, I, I, uh, that's a very good question actually and uh, as i said i personally believe that there is no need for uh, air prone ventilation because your ecmo should be able to uh, manage whatever your gas exchange needs are and i keep telling my trainees because you know that thought is there whenever the patient is desaturating they will increase the ventilator support and the whole purpose is lost you know you don't want to increase the ventilator support at all i tell them that even if you do a pneumectomy for example there is no lung at all you should still be able to manage the patients on ecmo and that is the whole purpose isn't it some patients who require lung transplant you will keep them on ecmo for a very long period of time there is no need of lungs at all actually if the ecmo is working well if the patient is hypoxic it means only two things one is i i say some problem with the ecmo machine itself and that's why it's not doing its job or your oxygen requirement has increased you know patient is septic patient is in hyperdynamic state for whatever reason the oxygen requirement is more than what uh, the ecmo is able to provide and that's why the patient is hypoxic these are the only two reasons but another uh, you no know, thing is that uh, which i am sure you know your center also does it uh, usually you will aim for a saturation of 92% or more you know in vb ecmo patient you will not aim for a saturation of 92% you will, you will not even aim for a saturation of 85% you know even 80% of saturation is okay that is one of the biggest understanding we have had you know in uh, recent times so that uh, you know we have sent uh, you know sometime our patients had a saturation of 70% and we have been okay with that because we do awake uh, ecmo these patients are awake these patients is are talking these patients are eating and drinking so what you know if they have a saturation of 70% you don't have to increase anything at all you know that has given us confidence as well that you know the brain is getting enough oxygen so why do you need to you know struggle to increase oxygenation anymore so my advice is make sure ecmo is working well the flow and all that is okay the recirculation is not there the oxygen requirement uh, has not increased treat sepsis or any other uh, no additional problems the patient may have and aim for a lower oxygen uh, level and at no, no time increase the ventilator support because increasing the ventilator support short time it might increase your oxygenation and reduce the carbon dioxide but long long time these patients will be badly affected because of uh, further lung injury and uh, you know cytotoxic uh, uh, oxygen free radicals and all that release and multi organ failure secondary infection so uh, your aim should be to give the lung as much protection as possible and uh, so your, your hemoglobin I, target what is your target sorry? Target hemoglobin target hemoglobin uh, you know again uh, uh, rian shet is going to give a talk tomorrow and he will talk extensively on that okay. usually uh, hemoglobin uh, you know in normal patients you would aim for a 7 to 8 isn't it yeah. unless it is less than 7 you will not but uh, in these patients you would uh, usually aim for a higher hemoglobin target usually the recommendation is 10 yeah, rian will uh, go very nicely with that you know with lots of studies and you know pathology and all that but the higher hemoglobin because oxygen carrying capacity will depend on hemoglobin and uh, you know and flow flow you can only go up to 60 to 70% after that if you want to improve the oxygenation you only way you can do is increasing the hemoglobin so here you will have a higher threshold compared to your normal icu patients okay thank you thank you sir what are the things you looking for when patient ecmo fio2 is increasing uh, uh, higher and higher yes uh, what do you suspect actually so first of all you know when we start uh, ecmo we'll always start with 100% uh, you know uh, on ecmo and on the ventilator we'll go to the rest lung setting which is like 100 to 150 tidal volume and uh, the 40% to 30% fio2 and uh, you know uh, when you start the fio2 will be 100% only and it will remain 100% for a very long time until uh, you know the you have extubated the patient and all the organ failures have resolved and all that only once the patient starts improving uh, when uh, it looks like the lung is recovering that is the only time you will reduce the support on the uh, ecmo there is no point uh, you know trying to reduce the uh, fio2 on the ecmo on the day 2 day 3 because you know there's the, you know who are needs ecmo even in non covid patients Uh, their lung is very badly damaged it will take at least one week for the lungs to improve uh, so you know if the uh, fio2 on ecmo is 100% on day 3 or day 4 it doesn't mean that it is a failure you know that was one of the misunderstanding we had also you know that that time the cardiac surgeons were heavily involved in initiation of ecmo and they used to get very upset that patient is still on 100% oxygen and they used to declare that this ecmo is a fail uh, and uh, you know what we realized that you know it will be 100% for a long period of time 
and uh, your main uh, aim is to give the uh, pro uh, protection to the lung so that lung gets time to recover so after you for example you know two three weeks later you have reduced the oxygen to you know 50 percent or whatever then it, it increases you know for example yeah you have to look into uh, Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Rajivad, the ECMO circuit itself, is the cannula position is okay? Is there any kinking in the, uh, the cannula uh, circuit itself? Is the oxygenator is working okay? You know, you need to do pre and post uh, oxygenator gas exchange. Uh, or is it uh, because of the patient himself, you know, sepsis, increased oxygen requirement, hyperdynamic uh, circulation? Uh, so you will look into those and you will treat that. You know, again, the increasing the ventilator support is not answer. You will have to look into the ECMO. And you'll have to look into the patient itself. Uh, and it's an extensive topic, actually. You will have a class on uh, Friday about this. Thank you, sir. Sir, one Thank more you, thing. Uh, yeah, sure. But just once. Uh, you said the 87% are developed uh, uh, VAP. So to prevent yes. VAP, can we extubate and put the patient on either NIV or HFNC? Just yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's what uh, you, we have tried to do as well. Initially, you know, when we were extubating these patients in non-COVID uh, patients as well, uh, you know, we were not sure whether it's the right thing or not because the whole lung is completely diseased. And, uh, you know, now we have extubated that PEEP effect is gone as well. And uh, usually, typically what you will see on the chest X-ray in COVID, uh, no, ECMO patient, not COVID patient, any ECMO patient for that matter is, if you do a daily X-ray, you will see that uh, the uh, lung will become whiter and whiter and whiter. Yeah, even though the patients are on ECMO, that seems to be the normal uh, you know, way the, the disease progresses. So on day three or day four, your uh, lung will be completely wiped out. You know? And uh, whether extubating them and providing no PEEP at all, is it the right thing? Whether it will cause more collapse than atelectasis was the worry we had. So we used to routinely put them on uh, HFNC or NIV to give some uh, you know, PEEP. Having said that, recently in COVID time, we were not giving anything. Uh, we were asking them to do incentive spirometry and things like that. And uh, that seemed to be okay, you know, but uh, if you want, if you are worried about uh, atelectasis and all that, and you're not able to provide uh, chest physiotherapy, you can uh, put on, uh, you know, HFNC or NIV. But in our experience, uh, we, I, we, I feel it is not required. Just chest physiotherapy is more than enough. Well, this extubation and putting... Uh... On NAVR, HFNC, Rajesh, you are mentioning VBA ECMO or VA ECMO? Both you can do actually. VA ECMO is routinely done actually. Yeah. You know, because in VA ECMO, both uh, the heart and lung is taken care by the ECMO. It is very easy to uh, you know take them off and uh, it's a routine practice. But uh, what uh, you know we are proposing awake ECMO is for VBA ECMO. VBA ECMO, usual uh, thing is they will put on a, uh, do a tracheostomy. And then uh, they will put on uh, you know, lower ventilatory support on that, and slowly they will uh, wean off. What uh, we are proposing, you know, we have given a, a publication as well in this is uh, you know uh, once the ECMO is working well, you don't need ventilation. You know, you don't even need even tracheostomy. You can just extubate them, and it is actually better for the patients. Uh, did I answer your question? Ah, uh, but uh, ah, yeah, you answered. But uh, mm. it's a, for me, it looks like a challenging task because a patient, no, no. Uh, I think we need more experience. I Yeah, what my advice to you is, uh, you know, when you have a ECMO patient next time, uh, please yeah. get in touch with us. You know, we can, uh, uh, from day one itself, uh, we can guide. I understand, you know, uh, uh, you were uh, in uh, this thing. In Hyderabad also, there was one uh, case uh, where they were able to, uh, manage uh, with the help of uh, Rian Shetty, who's going to talk tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they were able, that patient survived, I think. You know, uh, collaboration in these patients, especially for the first few cases, can be uh, you know very helpful. Uh, so uh, my advice sure. is, I you know, we'll get in touch with us and we are sure. more than happy to you know, sure. guide for the first few cases. Once uh, you have few successes, uh, yeah. then you will see that the whole system is better prepared compared to before. There is more Yes. And he'll be able to do more uh, ECMO patients. Sure, thank you. Three, three more questions, uh, Rajesh. One is, uh, what is the longest duration of uh, ECMO you kept on the patient? And second thing is... Uh, we can't hear you. 
Dr. Mohan, we are not able to hear you. Ah. What is the longest duration of patient kept on ECMO at this point? Second thing is really, really thankful for giving us a support uh, for a future uh, ECMO cases. You Thank already uh, readily accepted and we are ready to really take the help of you to do the ECMO cases. And uh, because from the beginning, and that's the reason we started on this, maybe after uh, next month, we'll just have a monthly one connection of this along with so that we anywhere, anywhere in our account, because we are like a group working, different, different yeah. hospitals working, any hospital we put ECMO, we'll reach out to you and get the uh, things done. So that the, finally, the patient outcome is more important, which hospital does, doesn't matter for us. That's so correct, yeah. that's very important so that all of us can be experienced and improve our knowledge. And yes. how long normally the cost will be there, yours approximate? So the first of all, uh, the uh, duration on ECMO, the one I presented at that time, it was the longest was 72 days. Now uh, it has been going on for a long time, actually, even after three months, people are uh, keep, keeping the patients on ECMO. And every month uh, you see that uh, the new and new, new publication saying that uh, we have had a longer, we have had a longer. The, from my memory, what I can remember is 142 days was the longest one. But I'm sure that record will be broken very soon because people are getting more and more confident. And with COVID especially, the lung can recover as well. So it may be better to wait rather than refer them for a lung transplant. And uh, the cost, yeah, that is another misconception. I feel that ECMO will increase the cost. Uh, I would say ECMO will not increase the cost. Most of the cost you will have is a uh, cost of uh, you know, usual ARDS patients who require a long ICU stay. You know, I don't know what is your charges per day in ICU. If the patient is in ICU for uh, 100 days, for example, per day of that plus 100 days is going to be a lot of money, isn't it? So only those people who can afford uh, will be able to take this. And that is one of the problems, not because of ECMO, it's because the, our ICU costs are so high, you know, and uh, the patients require ICU stay for such a long time. On top of that, the ECMO, directly ECMO related cost is only circuit cost, which is uh, depending on which, uh, you know, ECMO machine you have, it, between two and a half to three and a half lakh rupees. Uh, that is the only extra cost. Some hospital charge uh, for ECMO, you know, per day, like ventilator and all that per day charge, they will charge for ECMO, which may be like 5,000, 6,000, whatever. Other than that, there is no extra cost on ECMO. Even the people feel that, okay, if you put on ECMO, the cost will increase. It's not because, uh, you know, patient, uh, you have put on ECMO and there is ECMO related cost. It's because ICU related costs. These patients will be on the ICU for a long time. And, uh, you know, I don't know how the charges are in your hospital. Yeah, you know, once we extubate them, their cost comes down because ventilator charges is not there. Once we stop oxygen, that cost will come down. In that way, you know, actually it can be less than your usual ICU patients as well. You know, if anything, I would say ECMO will uh, reduce the cost. If you take into account that any RDS patient will be in the hospital for a long period of time. You know, even uh, those normal RDS patients will be in ICU for 7 to 15 days anyway, isn't it? Uh, no, no one, if they have severe RDS, we're going to get discharged in four days. Uh, so three to four so, lakhs is additional cost. Do you think that one small, I don't know whether it's a correct question or not. Do you mm -hmm. think that uh, instead of putting the patient on ventilator, you put the patient on awake ECMO is better than ARDS patients? Now, some centers are trying that. You know, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, one of the patients had come to us uh, asking for a, you know, awake uh, ECMO. They said, you know, we have come from, they had come from Tamil Nadu only for ECMO. <laughs> Um, and uh, at that particular time, uh, we thought it was not uh, appropriate to put the patient on uh, ECMO because, you know, you have to try intubation, ventilation first and only if uh, fails, then you will put on, uh, when, uh, you know, this thing. But unfortunately, once the patient was uh, put on ventilator, you know, usually that uh, height of second wave, uh, they went into multi-organ failure and they died. Uh, uh, so many centers are now trying, putting patients straight on ECMO as well. You know, there are case reports. We haven't tried ourselves. We always go for uh, a ventilation proning. Only when it fails, we try ECMO. But uh, you know, you uh, I think in future that might become normal as well, where you will uh, put patients straight on it. We normally go for rescue ECMO. Yes, yeah, that's correct. We usually how, we do go for how for early you go for uh, awake uh, ECMO uh, once you because anyway at the time of putting procedure you put sedation everything. How that's early correct. you go for because to reduce uh, ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction whatever you. Have. So awake That's is better, but how early you go for awake, sir? What we do is second day. We try to extubate on the second day itself. Once uh, uh, our goals are achieved, patient is awake, no other organ failure is there, uh, or only mild hypotension is there, we aim for extubation on the second day. It's a maximum third day. 
it's as early as better. Usually, even tracheostomy is usually done on day three or day four. You know, in other centers where they don't do awake ECMO, they will put the tracheostomy on day three or day four. Once the patient is stable, you will go for uh, tracheostomy so that you can start uh, weaning the patients from ventilator. When I was talking to Dr. Hadi from Jumana Hadi, she was telling tomorrow if she plans for ECMO, today she will do tracheostomy. So I was just thinking how, how important it is. Uh, yeah, I think uh, she is uh, uh, one of the uh, person who uh, feels uh, better with the uh, you know, tracheostomy and weaning from there. Mm, uh, and that's why she does the tracheostomy first and then, uh, you know, uh, wean the, uh, the uh, ventilation and all that. Whereas we believe that, you know, uh, ventilation is not required and awake patient is, uh, you know, a talking patient is better. So we aim for extubation. Only if extubation is not possible, then we go for tracheostomy. Like uh, that uh, lady, we did a tracheostomy because she had a bleeding and she was, it was not possible to extubate her. Sir, I think uh, in mm. our setup, in my personal opinion, mm. sir, uh, we need to have a good uh, amount of uh, experience in an ECMO. Then only we can put a borderline cases or anything. Otherwise, I yeah, think... That is what I'm thinking. To, if was any center we put, we should approach this Raya... Uh, Rajesh Shetty team and uh, we all will be in the group so that everybody know what's happening to the patients. Yes, sir. So, at least we should try prone, I feel. At least uh, try a prone and then we need to put a ECMO yes. than going very early because... But as uh, Rajesh Shetty, you're telling that uh, what I'm telling is, uh, what I'm asking is, our understanding of the improving the basic anatomy and physiology of the lung. So, the proning will improve that. That's what is the concept. Am I right, Rajesh Shetty, sir? That's correct, yes. So, so, thanks. so pruning should you should uh, try, I feel. And if uh, pruning, pruning has failed, then you consider uh, ECMO. Mm -hmm. But yes. I would, uh, you know, for us in Indian setting, I would uh, say we should uh, uh, you know, wait until uh, intubation is done by maximum ventilatory, you know, all the strategies you have completed, including prone ventilation. Only if it fails, then you consider ECMO. And yes. there will be about 16% of patients who will require, you know, uh, as per your ProSeva study. The mortality is reduced from 32% uh, to 16%. So it's still there are 16% of patients who will fail prone ventilation as well. And those are the patients I would consider for ECMO. Yes, because even without trying the patient on a prone and going early, actually the complicators associated with the ECMO discussion is very easy. But Especially in, more... in initially, you know, until yes, your... Yes, uh, yes I agree. Uh, the hospital but also, is... right, they also says that the proning is the initial option before uh, for, uh, for, uh, yes, ECMO. Correct. Yes, sir. That's Thank correct. you. Thank you, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank so you. we'll uh, close the session, I think. Thank you, Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. Srinivas and everyone for giving this opportunity. We'll continue this conversation. Tomorrow, you'll have a talk from Dr. Riyan Shetty about uh, hypoxia in uh, VVF. It's a very good talk. I uh, request all of you to attend. Sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Bye. Thank you. All the best. Take care. Have a nice day. Bye.